Okay, well, let's move on in our search. The prophetic end game, the death of the godless delusion. What's all that about? Well, I'm sure you've all heard of Richard Dawkins, a very famous atheist. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote the book, The God Delusion. Uh, he certainly doesn't believe that God exists. I was rather interested on the side of this bus with Mr. Dawkins out the front of it. There's probably no God. Someone's not too sure whether there is or whether there isn't. Um, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Evidently the idea is that if you believe in God you don't enjoy life. I'm not quite sure that's the case. I've found it's the opposite actually. Since I know God I'm much happier than I was before, that's for sure. Anyway, well that was uh, Mr Dawkins. Now the question is, is God real? So we've noticed that Isaiah clearly made, showed that his book is absolutely written at the time he wrote it. Now we're going to have a look at some things that he had to say. The evidence from Bible prophecy is what I want to look at first. We'll take up some more evidence tomorrow uh, in our presentations. So what about the evidence from Bible prophecy that God is real? We want to look at the predictions of lost civilizations, mainly Israel when it came to um, the time of the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians. Now Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians and the Medes in 612 BC. We just looked at one of the campaigns of one of the Assyrian kings, but they came to a grinding halt in 612 BC when the Medes and the Babylonians combined together, had a big fight with them and took out the Assyrians. Now, the destruction of Nineveh is actually mentioned and predicted in the biblical writings. Maybe we weren't aware of that, but here are some of these predictions that are made in the Bible about Nineveh. These are made 640 BC. Flooding is going to be involved in Nineveh's downfall, according to the Bible. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an utter end of its place. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. This is all from the book of Nahum. He's writing before Nineveh is destroyed. Now we know sort of what happened. You see, the, river ba the, the city of Babylon is on the river Euphrates. The city of Nineveh was on the Tigris River. These are the two great rivers of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers. And uh, so around the time when the Babylonians and the Medes attacked the city, there was a flooding in the Tigris and it tore out a section of the wall of Nineveh. And evidently, the king thought, well, this is curtains now because the soldiers of the Medes and the Babylonians can get in. So he did the next thing. Nineveh was predicted that fire would be involved in Nineveh's downfall. Notice what it says. Same writer. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Now we sort of know what happened. The king, when he could see that the Medes and the Babylonians were going to take the city, he burnt the palace on top of himself and his family and uh, a great fire broke out in Nineveh and you can see that today. Here is a wall relief in the British Museum and you can clearly see this has been fire damage here, soot and so on, on this image that we have from Nineveh in the museum there in uh, London. Nineveh would become a desolation was the prediction. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation as dry as the wilderness. Now also it was predicted that flocks and birds would inhabit Nineveh. Notice the prediction. The herds shall lie down in her midst every beast of the nation. Both the pelican and the bittern shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold. Now, notice when you visit Nineveh today, which is Mosul, part of Mosul. You've heard of that with ISIS and so on. They destroyed a lot of stuff. But these are the walls where Nineveh, underneath the rubble here, these are the walls. And what's, what's grazing over the top? A bunch of animals. You know, it's uncanny what the Bible predicted and what we can even see of the predictions today, the herds lying down there. Prophetic 
reliability, prophetic accuracy. Now, we want to go back to the attacks by um, Sennacherib against the Jewish people. While, the, while he was besieging the city of Nineveh, while he was making his various uh, attacks against the country there, Hezekiah got sick and the prophet Isaiah came to visit and said, get your house in order because this is the end for you. You're going to die. Now, he didn't want to die. You wouldn't want to die either, would you? So he prayed, the Bible tells us. And when he prayed, God said, OK, I will let you have more years. So Isaiah, who's on his way out the palace already, he's told by God, go back and tell the king he's going to live longer. So he goes back and he talks to the king and says, well, God's going to give you another 15 years of life. Well, how do I know that's going to be true, says Hezekiah? What sign? Will you ask a sign? He says, well, I want the sundial, the shadow on the sundial to go backwards. Because it's easy to go forward, so make it go backwards. So it did. And so he was healed. Now, guess who was watching their sundials in another part of the world? The Babylonians. They were great um, studiers of the heavens in both astronomy and astrology. And uh, they saw the shadow on the sundial go backwards. So they thought, wow, that's rather novel, <laughs> to say the least. So after a while, they must have heard about the healing of Hezekiah. So they sent some delegates to Jerusalem to talk with the king and to find out, hey, how come that happened? So he's miraculously healed. And so the Babylonians show up. But the king, instead of talking about how good God was in healing him, what he did was he took them into his, his treasuries and showed them all his gold and silver and the whole works. And then when they'd gone, uh, Isaiah the prophet comes to visit the king. This is the story that's told in Isaiah's writings. He says, hey, who was here a while ago? Who came to see you? Oh, the Babylonians came to see me. Oh, yeah, okay. What did you show them? Well, I showed them everything, all my treasures. You fool, said Isaiah. What a stupid thing that was, because they're going to come back one day and take all your stuff. And it's at that point that he makes predictions. Now, what I want you to remember is it's very clear that he wrote in 700 BC, because of all the stuff that he mentioned about Sennacherib's invasion, which was happening at the same time. Notice the predictions. Here are his prophecies. Number one, he said the Babylonians are going to destroy Jerusalem and take captives back to Babylon. Here's his prediction. Behold, the days are coming. Now remember, the Babylonians are not in charge at this point. They're not number one. The Assyrians still are at this time. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hence, we began last week with who? Daniel carted off to Babylon. This is in fulfillment of that. Nineveh was destroyed, as we said, in 612 BC. And now the Babylonians become the leading superpower in the Mediterranean, Middle Eastern world. They are number one now. And we saw that in the pro pro prophecies last week from Daniel's book. Nebuchadnezzar becomes the king after his father Nabopolassar dies. And so he rules from 605 to 562 BC. He's the one that took Jerusalem and destroyed the city and took captives to Babylon. Now, 700 BC, Isaiah is going to predict now how not only will they go into captivity, but God is going to bring them out of captivity. And so he makes predictions about Cyrus, the Medo-Persian king, who's not yet born. He's 150 years into the future. So let's notice what he says. Number one, he says, Cyrus will dry up Babylon's river or its sea, which is the Euphrates River. He talks about the drying up of the river. Who says to the deep, be dry. And I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure. I want you to notice the number of times he mentions Cyrus by name 
and he refers to him in this passage. It starts in about Isaiah 40 and onwards. Now even Jeremiah, about a hundred years later, and yet this is still 70 years into the future from his time, roughly, he talks about the drying up of the river. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will plead your case. He's talking about Israel. I'm going to fight for you and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her. That's Babylon. He's talking about her sea, which is the Euphrates River. He also predicts that Babylon's gates are going to be left open for Cyrus. Notice the prediction. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. Very specific prediction here. Lastly, two more things. Cyrus is going to set the Israelites free and allow them to rebuild Jerusalem, all still 150 years into the future. Thus says the Lord, To his anointed, to Cyrus, I have raised him up in righteousness. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free. He's going to be the one that allows them to build their city. Lastly, Cyrus is going to restore the temple. The one that Solomon built, which was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to rebuild the temple. Here it is. Who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, he will perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundations shall be laid. So were these prophecies fulfilled? The ones about the destruction of Babylon and so on? Let's notice. The last night of the Babylonians was October 13, 539 BC. You remember from last week. The Mede and Persians attacked or fought the Babylonians outside the city at first. The Babylonians lost. They withdrew into their city behind their massive walls thinking they were safe. And so because they thought they were safe, they thought they'd party on. And you remember we talked about the writing on the wall. King King Belshazzar's feast it's called and the famous painting there by Rembrandt, this one here. Now, what I want you to notice is not only does the Bible mention this feast, but so do some of the ancient historians like Herodotus. They tell there was a big feast of the Babylonians going on at this time. And that's why it's recorded in the biblical records. Now, that strange writing on the wall, the words were, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsen. Nobody knew what that meant. And finally, Daniel comes in. As the king asked him, he says, okay, what does it mean? He says, it means this, king, you are weighed in the balances. Now, balances in the ancient world were symbols of judgment. You even see that with the Egyptians. You can see scenes from the Book of the Dead on the tombs and temple walls and the papyrus documents. They put your heart on one of the balance pans and the feather of truth on the other, and they weigh your heart. But all the Egyptians were very good people because they all got through the judgment. (laughs) Oh, good liars, one of the two. (laughs) And, And so the balances, well, they were in Babylon. You're weighed in the balances. You're found wanting. Your kingdom is taken from you and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, Belshazzar lost his own life. Tragic. He knew all about the things about Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, but he did nothing. That's why Daniel said, the very God that holds your life in his hands, you knew, but you did nothing. And now his life was ended. Anyway, while they're having the party, the Medes and the Persians are finishing off some work they started some time before in this siege, where they were diverting that part of the river Euphrates, which flowed through the city of Babylon, part of it flowed through. They were taking some, digging some channels off to lower the level of the river as it ran through the city to to dry it up, so to speak, to make it very little water so they could march along it. And that's what they did. The Medes and the Persians marched along pretty much what we call a a dry river, but just a muddy thing and with a bit of water in it. They marched in and now they were alongside the walls because this is the part of the river they were in. They lowered this. So they're in here. But hey, you still can't get in because you've got all these walls. Now they had river gates, and here's one of them here in the artist's impression. 
So they still couldn't get in. But amazingly, we're not sure why, but the gates were left open. Maybe the soldiers, the guards were partying too uh, that night, but they left the gates open and the Babylonians were completely taken by surprise by the Medes and the Persians. They took the city without hardly a fight from the Babylonians. And the point is, all these predictions were precisely fulfilled. Now, the Bible not only makes the predictions in the book of Isaiah, but it even records their fulfillment in the book of Ezra. If you ever go to the Old Testament, a book called Ezra. It talks about how Cyrus let the people come out of their homeland to go back to, out of Babylon to go home. He gave them money. He let them build the temple and go home. And all that exactly was, was predicted. It's mentioned there. But here is what is interesting. This little clay cylinder here, it's about so long, this is in the British Museum today, and this tells us that Cyrus took the city, he allowed the people to go to their homelands, and he allowed them to build their temples. Just as the Bible predicted, just as the Bible records, so did the Medo-Persians record it. That's why this book, its prophecies are reliable. It doesn't guess at stuff. It doesn't make stuff up. It's the real McCoy, as we say. It's the real deal. And uh, this is what they discovered. Now, the point of raising this this afternoon is to answer this question. Why these predictions? Because we're going to get into a bunch of predictions here dealing with our own time as we proceed through Daniel and Revelation in this series. We'll be looking at the seven trumpets that blow in Revelation and the seven seals and a whole range of things that have everything to do with you and I. Why these predictions? Why prophecy? Right in the heart of this discussion about Cyrus is going to do all these things, this is what Isaiah says. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I have even called you by your name. He named him. Who's going to do all this before it's even happened? What for? Why did God make these predictions about Cyrus coming? That they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting. In other words, the whole world from one end to the other so that everyone may know that there is none beside me I am the Lord and there is no other. So evidently, according to this prophecy about Babylon's destruction and so on, the reason God does this is that we will know that there is someone out there. That's what he's telling us. A little later, Isaiah says these words in the same discussion about Cyrus coming. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I'm declaring the end from the beginning so I can see from this end what's going to happen way down at the end or down in the future. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Now, this is exactly what Jesus of Nazareth said when he was here, when he made predictions. Now, I tell you before it comes so that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. And in the Greek, it mentions that I am, I, I am. I am God, in other words. So prophecy helps us believe in God. Prophecy is God's signature that he is. He exists. That's the point of this writing from the prophet Isaiah. Now, the last question here, why does he want us to believe in him? So what that God exists? What's the so what? Here it is, and Isaiah finishes off or brings us to this point. What for? Look to me, says God. Trust me. Believe in me. Why? And be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. What does he mean, be saved? He means be in the last empire that we talked about last week. Be part of that last empire where there are no tears. Oh, man, last night I'm sitting in, I'm in bed. It's two o'clock. I told you the story about the lady in Sydney in the hotel last week. I heard the same thing last night. Tragedy. Just outside my window, this poor lady sobbing her heart. Oh, man. No tears, no pain, no sorrow, no death. That's the last empire. And God tells us predictions before they happen so that when they happen, you and I might believe and be part of this thing. 
so that we can have that never-ending life. So prophecy helps us believe or trust in God so we can be in the last empire. So is God real? Well, Bible prophecy says yes, there is a God. You cannot make these predictions and get it right like it does here in this book, but that someone's not telling you something. I want to give you two or three more today as we close because we're looking today and tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be looking at scientific evidence. By the way, if you've got a friend that doesn't believe there's a God or his wonders, you bring them tomorrow because we're going to give a, some incredible scientific evidence that he's for real. Tomorrow I'll be taking you to what scientists are saying today that's pointing to these things very clearly. Now, the providential hand of God, what does that mean? The interventions by God in the affairs of individuals and even nations. Let's go back to the prophet Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, 6th century BC. Notice what it says here. When he comes into Babylon, now God had brought Daniel into the favour and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Behind your life and my life, God is at work. If you look back, you will see the hand of God in your life. I certainly have seen that. Now, not only in the lives of individuals, but nations. Notice what Daniel, he's just been given that same dream that the king had we mentioned last week. And notice what he says in his prayer. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and forever. For he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. Behind the play and counterplay of human beings on the political level, behind the scenes, God is silently in control. Whether we understand that or not, that's his claim. All right. Let me give you a couple of examples of we've seen that in modern times. I'm sure you've heard of the miracle of Dunkirk. It's even called the miracle of Dunkirk for very good reasons. Now, if you remember the story, probably you may have seen the film that Hollywood put out recently. You remember that the British and the French soldiers were trapped on the beach of Dunkirk. They had nowhere else to go except you want to swim to England. <laughs> they were trapped Hitler's panzers were ready to run them over, but for some strange reason, he never acted. We don't know why. The weather helped them a little bit to get people onto boats, and some 338,000 soldiers were saved to fight another day. The Nazis should have easily walked into England. The Battle of Britain was another miracle. Hitler had many more planes than the British did. Um, it believed the turning point came for the British when accidentally some of their bombers dropped some bombs on Berlin and Hitler got furious because he thought, his people thought no one had ever bombed Berlin. And so he decided instead of bombing the airfields where he was starting to wipe out the the defeat the British, he would now bomb London. And by changing from uh, the airfields to London, the Battle of Britain was eventually 